Hey everyone, welcome back. It's been a while since episode one, I'd say. The fact of the matter is we had an episode two and uh, so forth on a roll, but uh, the content was uh, lost in production. Well, lost in production, I would say, is a bit of understatement. I think it was in my bag that didn't sink when I was traveling and road tripping through Europe, but here we are. And I think we got quite many updates for you uh, listening in today. Yeah, a lot has happened since then. So we've had a lot of projects, uh, a lot of AI projects. Definitely. And as you can see, we are not in our usual first episode environment. We're actually traveling today. Uh, we've been investigating and executing on quite many AI projects, which are super interesting. Yeah, I think uh, we wanted to share a little bit about the kinds of AI projects that we actually work on. and. Um, they, they can range from everything from uh, mundane AI projects, which are probably what you're familiar with, to quite esoteric. Um, so where to start is the good question that I think we're both contemplating about here. But my favorite topic and the one I have at hand is I've been a data scientist for quite a while. And as you all know, I've never been a very good data scientist but I've always been fascinated about execution, getting AI into production. I mean, all the way in 2016, I was on stage saying, oh, how is the least path of resistance to go to production monitoring before the, the MLOP stage? Today, we have matured so much. So one of the topics we are working very heavily with one of our customers are, how do you create capabilities? Not just to create one use case, not just to create two or 10, but rather the scale of 50 integrated into business, you need to start lifting the concept from, oh, I have an AI platform. You need to start talking about capabilities. So that's one of the topics we've been working so heavily. And it's not a technical one. So unfortunately for you listening and wanting to see that the technical, you have to wait a few minutes, but we talk about capabilities now. So, so Robert, what do you say? Technical capabilities and enablement capabilities. Yeah, it's um, a term that's uh, on the surface very easy to dismiss because everybody thinks they knows what capabilities are. But let's go ahead and define it. I think uh, uh, capabilities, the way we've been working uh, with capabilities at customers has to do with um, what the word itself means rather than some kind of secret term. Uh, it's something that you can do with AI and it's deceivingly simple. Uh, specifically technically, pe technical minded people tend to get caught in details like we need the ability to do version control or something yeah. like that. And uh, a lot of AI projects get stuck in the kinds of features that they want to deploy at customers uh, and capabilities that are very technical minded. But that's not really where the projects get stuck, are they? No, no, definitely. And, and just to stop you there because you talked about version control as a capability. You had a very good example that we ran through today. Mm -hmm. You said something around, well, I want to be able to do Git, but Git in itself isn't why you want to do it. You want to be able to do version control, but honestly, it's not really version control that you want to do. It is actually collaboration that yeah. you want to do. So the capability that we're after is capability. The underlying technology in itself isn't important because 20 years ago, we didn't talk about Git. We didn't talk about that tools set of technologies. We talked about other things. But today we still want to achieve the same capability just for modern ways of doing it. Mm. But by defining the high level of capability, we can understand what it is that we want to achieve and we start understanding that the underlying technology is interchangeable and it progresses and it evolves. And the same thing goes for all things AI. The things we know today are not the same things we're gonna know in a year or two years or even five or 10 or 20 years. Yeah, so you have an organization that's trying to figure out where to put its resources and what to focus on. And uh, when you put it in terms of the capabilities that you want, uh, it does help you focus, but specifically putting it in terms of something like collaboration, uh, which is high level enough, um, really takes it away from the tech focus. Because what we end up seeing is customers that build these platforms that have lots of technical capabilities, but really aren't in touch with 
what neither developers want nor users of the systems want. So something like developers wanting to be able to collaborate. Like what do developers want? They want maybe a place to put their files. They want a way to sync their code with each other. Collaborating. I think speaking in those terms really makes it more amenable to running a kind of a project. Um, I think you're right, but only partially right. Because in the day when I speak to developers and, and peers, the main thing they ask for is usually it gets down to, oh, this doesn't work, this doesn't work. And end of the day, it boils down to business doesn't know what they want. Mm. And I think there's still a big gap in organizations where you have business on one hand asking ridiculous requirements because they don't understand the technical difficulties in doing that. And you have really talented technical people, both data scientists, AI engineers, machine learning engineers, data engineers, software engineers, trying to scramble up all the resources to fulfill the business needs. It's like, oh, we want to improve the, the customer satisfaction, but it's such a high level statement, so it's hard to actually do. When we break that down, especially from a delivery organization into capabilities, we can actually start pushing back and saying to the business that, okay, you say you want customer satisfaction, but what is it really that you're after? And boil down to the hard nut to say, okay, that means you need X, Y, and Z. So, so these guys go to the conferences and they hear all these terms. They're like, these are the things you need to have. You need to have data mesh. You need to have this and that. And there's like this long list of like 50 things. And realistically, you can only do 10 of them. How do you boil them down? You know, we're talking about capabilities, but and yeah. so how does that connect? And, and capabilities is just a way of executing on the actual things that you want to do. And end of the day, it boils down to not the most interesting projects, but usually if you're a business and maybe not a research, it boils down to the results that you want to achieve. And Google, once upon a time, I think it was Eric Schmidt said, more bats per inning. What does that mean? More bats per inning, for those of you that don't know baseball, I don't know baseball, but I know the analogy, is basically boiling it down to how can we do more and more experiment in a controlled way? And having capabilities is a good way of having reusable path to testing new things. Oh, we think that the customer needs better recommendation. Oh, the customer didn't need better recommendation. If you can boil that statement down into three months rather than two years, you can, in that time period, test a lot of other statements as well. And capabilities is the way of professionalizing the AI way of actually doing it. Better recommendations, okay, we do the recommendation engine, we do the data access, we do the productionization. If you do that the right way by identifying capabilities, you can reuse 90% of those things for the next use case. And for the next use case, it'll go faster and faster. There's even statements right now and even studies saying the time to get things into production correlate with the years of experience that the organization has in putting things into production. Why? Because they become more professional. They reuse, they have better methodologies and it goes faster. And that's the capability led thinking and driving AI. Is this an exercise in taxonomy? That I don't remember the name of the movie, but there's a movie where a guy says that uh, the word you're looking for is symbolism. And, and there's a power in symbolism, and uh, maybe not symbolism is the correct word here, but uh, if, we're, if we're talking about capabilities here, we're talking about something like collaboration. You want to enable collaboration between developers. Uh, it does make sense to unify people around a common terminology of what it is we want to achieve, because what we do see is a lot of people talking about things like value, we have to create customer value, and other things like that, and use these words, value, collaboration, or whatever, but they're not actually talking about the same thing in the organization, yeah. right? And so when you're talking with a technical person, they'll, they'll dismiss this kind of practice and be like, oh, this is just fluff. We gotta get down to work, we gotta get busy and stuff, but like, before people have actually agreed on what needs to be done, you can't actually start the work. And this is a sort of high level exercise of agreeing on common terminology, high level terminology. You can't yep. start working before you've agreed on that stuff. Yeah, I fully agree, 100% uh, agree. And I think that the biggest problem here is people not agreeing on the terminology, but it's even worse than that in most companies because people, don't even agree on who is accountable for execution, picking use cases. I usually see many IT organizations, for instance, that think that they are going to execute all the use cases 
determining the use cases without anchoring to those that has the budgets. Hmm. So this is a super complex question. And I mean, it's not something we're going to solve from, from day one, but I think the AI community is maturing. And I mean, all of you listening in, you're probably listening in because you are aware the changes we see right now in the market is a level of maturity that will exist in the AI community for the next couple of years. We are stop talking about platforms and tools. They are still important because that's how we do the execution, but we'll start focusing more on what we want to achieve, how we're going to achieve it and how we're going to scale it. But specifically in a structured way. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's not just the Wild West or anything, because the point here is you have your 20 data scientists or your 50 data scientists or whatever it ends up being, and you can't just hire one new data scientist for every extra use case you want. And you need to have a structure in place for how to make sure that those people can increase their productivity and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, you need to have a, a methodology so, in place. This is not something we are making up, because if you read Nicole Forsgren's book, she, she has Swedish heritage, I probably think, because her last name we'll sounds like it. We'll include the link down below so <laughs> yeah. you can check it out. Yeah, she, she, uh, she was leading the research project called uh, Accelerate, State of Art of DevOps. It was released in 2019, super good book, where they actually quantity measured companies from an engineering perspective. Those that were good at putting things into production, not just AI, but engineering and practical software. And they measured on the amount of people, just adding more people into the process, how it in digital laggards were decreasing productivity, mm. but in digital forerunners were actually increasing productivity. And we're at the stage in AI development right now that we're falling in the same pathway. So if you feel like your company is lacking the tools, the processes and the professionalism to run, AI driven projects, you're probably just slowing down your development process by adding more data scientists or machine learning engineers, rather than clearly defining on how they work, what tools and uh, processes they should use methodologies, because that will start increasing. That's just my hypothesis built on the research that we've seen from software engineering. For sure, there's this, a great analogy here, which is you have a cart that you want to pull faster and you think that by adding more horses, it's going to go faster. And so you end up with like 10, 15 horses pulling it for It's not going no. faster. No. No. <laughs> so that was it, I think, on the capability track that we've been building quite extensively the, well, since the last uh, episode. We have some other interesting things as well. So we don't just do um, uh, classic corporate stuff. We do pretty esoteric stuff. One of our customers in specific has asked us uh, to do something that's fairly cutting edge. And what's more cutting edge than AI art? So basically, I want to discuss AI art a little bit on a and surface level. We just want to disclose that if you're listening in on this, in a few months, you will be aware of the full scope of, of, of what we're doing because it's going to be out there. But we want to discuss the, the general concepts in behind why we are doing these things as well. So I think that the general concept of these things is we think it's important to actually walk the, the talk. Mm. I think walking the talk means that we're not just about creating the capabilities from a high level perspective, but actually understanding what it means. And mixing these different components is, yes, we are looking for more professionalism, but we are also looking for next generation of capabilities from the technical perspective. That means mixing a cross-functional genre. So art, state-of-the-art algorithms, and how can we get the best of human interactions without having too much bias into the process? Robert, what is your thinking? This is really uncharted territory. Right? We're, we're, we're at the forefront of AI, at the forefront of, of what it means to be human in certain respects. And so uh, it's not entirely clear um, you know, what's going to come next, what the right thing to do is, and all that kind of stuff. So we're sort of building the ship as we sail it. And so there are a lot of interesting topics when it comes to AI art, which is really at the forefront of, of uh, one of the um, areas uh, where, where there's a lot of AI research going on. And it's one of the projects that we're heavily involved in with one of our customers. 
So I, I wanted to touch on a couple of topics. I wanted to hear your thoughts yep. on it. Um, this uh, particular project uh, involves tangentially uh, AI models like Dolly and Mid Journey and so forth. And so for those that are listening that might know or, or maybe don't know, um, Dolly and Mid Journey are a fairly modern kind of AI algorithm where you can provide text prompts and you can actually provide uh, image prompts, all sorts of inputs to the AI model to help it generate art, essentially. And uh, I wanted to touch on a couple of topics that are personal to me. For example, is this art? Um, what is our role in this process? And so we can later on go into uh, what is the human's role in all of this. But uh, let, let's go uh, piece by piece into this. Uh, so I, I do a lot of music myself on the side. And uh, one of the questions I hear a lot is, is AI art really art? Well, one thing I'd like to disclose to the audience is, when, at least when it comes to music, a lot of the music that you hear is not actually played by artists the way you think it is. The singer is not actually singing as great as they think you are, as you think they are. The drums might be programmed, and the computer might be doing a very heavy workload. So, I just want to stop you there because there there are two different levels of art. We we all know music, and mm. you all know the. A very upbeat music that anybody can produce as long as you follow the same recipe we're gonna listen to it because we're programmed to. Mm -hmm. Then there is the level of surface and depth within art and I think the conversation we at some point need to have can AI provide depth? Can it write a book the same way as the classics mm -hmm. or will it just follow up what people want? Yeah. Are we out for AI providing thought leadership, the next generation of thinking within the art scene, yeah. or copying and mimicking what's always been proven to be a good recipe? Yeah. Everybody's gonna pick up the, the next new novel that provides some sort of insights and people are gonna look in what the housewives are doing, but will it provide the next classic? Will it be the next Aldous yeah. Huxley and Brave New World type of, of writer? Yeah. Can we get there? What I want to suggest to viewers is to not get baited into these clickbaity type gotcha things where you say, I told you it wasn't art or I told you it was art or whatever it might be. Um, uh, first of all, when it comes to art, my personal opinion is that anybody that wants to join the art club is allowed to. It doesn't mean you're gonna be popular. It doesn't mean anybody's gonna think uh, they like what you're doing, but I believe it's art. But I think of uh, an AI a little bit like, consider, for instance, the Queen of England that uh, commissioned uh, Shakespeare to write a play for her. I don't think anybody in their right mind would say, well, it's actually the Queen of England that made the play and Shakespeare was just paid to do it and he just took his experience based on studying a bunch of poetry and made an amalgamation and spit something out based on the Queen's description or prompt. But wh when I describe it like that, you sort of see a similarity in what we would do with something like Dolly. So for the listeners, just to be clear, with Dolly, what you do is you put in a text prompt, for example, uh, make a picture of a horse uh, on, on the moon at night and it will spit out a picture that it thinks is a horse on the moon at night. And so similarly, you would imagine maybe that the Queen of England says to Shakespeare, spit out a play about me where I look really good and I win at the end. Hmm. Something like that. And so Shakespeare comes back and says, okay, I've, I've given you a play, here's the play. Uh, nobody would probably say, well, Shakespeare is just, you know, statistically collating stuff. Uh, do, do you see the similarities? <laughs> I there? do see the similarities. Uh, and I think that we're moving into areas still uncharted. Mm. And I think us as AI experts to kind of deep dive into the tools and technologies, the question I think that you that are listening should kind of take back with you, is this important? If you are creating the next Shakespeare from an AI perspective, do you have any responsibility for doing that? For adding or removing biases or kind of commanding and doing whatever the subject tells you to do? 
This is a deep philosophical question that will take longer than the time we have today, but it is a very interesting one. Of course, we, we're not going to be able to cover yet on, on the product that we're working on and, and how we're doing it. That will be hopefully a later episode uh, when you're fully aware on the, the output. What we do want to take or what we do want you to take with you is what are the areas of limitations and what is art? That's an even harder question because we've been asked to look into this and we've been asked to create something but what does good look like? And who determines if the output is good or bad? Because what we are creating, or primarily Robert <laughs> uh, and, and Aladdin, uh, is basically just the input on the limitations they put into it. And where do we go from here? The, uh, I think one of the first things that becomes very apparent here is that uh, there's no, it's a team effort. There's and no like, I in team. Well, the thing now is that the AI is part of the team. Yeah. And you have to understand how much a part of the team they are. I know a lot of people like to say that AI is just a tool, but it really is more than just a tool. Um, I think uh, I really like analogies from music. You know, if you, if you are writing a song, but you're not good at drums, you might hire a session drummer to help you. And that session drummer will add some of their personality to what you're doing. And we can totally see how AI adds its element to anything that it's involved in, to a greater or lesser degree. It will add its biases, it will add its personal touch. But it will still be sentient, right? Sentient? You yeah. think of itself? Uh, I believe that AI is sentient in the same way a chicken is sentient, yeah. Yeah. For sure. It's a strong statement worthy of discovering or investigating in another episode, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can make, a, we can make an entire episode on that yeah. one. But uh, I guess the point here is that um, uh, this should serve as a way to temper your expectations, right? I, I think a lot of times people think of things in terms of right and wrong just and unjust, uh, those really aren't uh, useful terms. They don't really help you to, to, to move things forward and to make good decisions. It's better to think of these things as processes, the same way we think of people, right? Um, a drummer, you don't think of a drummer as making a, a right or a correct or a good or a bad drum fill. You just think of like, mm, I didn't like that. Maybe we need to change but the way But if you say working. processes, Mm. I would rather restate it as progression mm -hmm. and progression doesn't need to be good but I think what we're seeing now that we can add on things like the, the AI components is the progression good or bad mm -hmm. I mean if we give it limitations then it will keep within the boundaries if we try to open it up but let's say like this because there's an implicit thing in what you're saying yeah. about good and bad uh, I, uh, maybe we can say, okay, so good and bad is obviously in the direction that we want it to go or not want it to go. And how do we know that something is going in the direction we want it to go? Uh, the way you and I would probably do it is to measure it somehow. Yeah. <laughs> well, the data-driven approach. Yes. Yeah. So, yes. And I guess maybe that's one thing that differentiates art from other things in general, is that art, you don't tend to really measure arts, like how good is this song on a scale from one to ten or something. but. In most cases, you can, you should probably be measuring, you know, what it is you're doing, how good it is. Yes, I think we are coming maybe to the end of this discussion. Mm -hmm. Well, at this stage, because there's so much untold to, to start saying. What do you think? Is there something here? Can art be good or bad? And how can we utilize AI to kind of involve the art genre? Mm -hmm. I never been a part of it before and these type of questions popped up most recently when we start having the philosophical philosophy philosophical we, we will be adding more philosophy aspects to these because yeah. it's unavoidable yes so i mean if you have a comment and if you have an input on this just drop us a line or write a comment or just like this comment or like this uh uh post for more yeah 
we'll be trying to make them more ad hoc and more personal uh, as we do work and really get you connected to the kind of uh, you know cutting edge projects that we're doing. Yeah. I'd like to get you uh, just a little primer on on the two most popular models, which I think can be interesting for viewers, which are Dolly and Mid Journey. One thing that's particularly cool about Dolly is it has a really good understanding of the context of an image. So for example, if Dolly is looking at a, a picture uh, or a scene, it will understand the things that are in the scene. It will, it will understand the chair, it will understand, you know, the clothing style and that kind of thing. Uh, whereas Mid Journey is much more powerful at understanding um, aesthetic stuff. It will understand the composition of the scene, mm. the colors, the style, and other things. So I think that's pretty cool to be able to differentiate the two. Dali is uh, much better at understanding things. Mid Journey is much better at understanding feelings. Yeah. It's sort of cool that they can be different in that way. On that note, I think that's a good final learning from this yeah. episode. Thank you so much for, for tuning in. We'll try to make these more frequent and I promise to safeguard my hardware for next time. Take care and I wish to see all of you soon. See you around.